Uh, we have Michael Pacina, he's from Piper Oldman, and he'll be talking about a range of things, including how the government is uh, regulating and also taxation and what the space is doing in terms of, uh, I guess, trying to improve the marketplace, improve the ecosystem so that we can get the balance of regulation and innovation right. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Well, thank you all for um, giving up your time on a Saturday morning to come along to the Gaia conference and for, to come along to my talk in particular. There's a big scary red clock that I don't usually have on talks, but I'll try not to let it put me off. Now you'll see up here, um, there usually people say put away your phones, shame on you if you're using your phone during a presentation, but I take the opposite view. Um, I've got a couple of questions I wanted to ask everyone in the crowd because it'll help me tailor a few things that I'll speak about during the presentation. So if I can get people to whip out their phones and open up um, www.menti.com, that would be much appreciated. Um, also, given our time limits, I'll try and keep this reasonably tight. So while people are filling that in, um, I head up the blockchain and fintech group at Piper Alderman Lawyers. So we've been involved in uh, fintech and the blockchain space since some of the early ICOs. We acted or advised about half of the top 10 Australian ICOs back in the day. Um, and I've been, had the pleasure to brief a number of senators down in Canberra on the Libra project recently. Uh, and of course, we're fairly heavily involved in the Senate's FinTech and RegTech inquiry, which is going to have some, um, I'm not sure how many people know what CryptoKitties are, but those who do know, I think I know who that might be who answered, but we'll see how many come up um, on the screen. So there's going to be some really interesting stuff happening in the next couple of years out of Canberra relating to digital assets in particular. Now, I'm just going to quickly count number in the room so I know roughly when to move on to the next question. So we'll probably call it when we have about 20 or 25 responses. So if you do want to chuck in a response, chop, chop. Um, I'm also, uh, unfortunately, due to my wife bidding on a house in about 15 minutes while I'm not there, I'm not going to be around for the panel this afternoon. So if you have any questions, please put up your hand. You will need to call out because I can't see much of the crowd with these brilliant lights that we have. Um, so any questions at any time. Um, otherwise, I should hopefully be around depending on my wife's skill at the auction, uh, for lunch as well, and I'm happy to have a chat with anyone outside. All right, so we've got a bit over 20 responses. That's pretty much what I expected. I'm going to assume many of the CryptoKitty responses are some of the people who are speakers. Or can I get a show of hands, any of the crowd who are the CryptoKitty people? I knew it was you. <laughs> I should have said, presenters aren't allowed to take part in these, they're going to skew the results. So. Th this is actually uh, more intermediate responses than I normally get. Usually this would skew pretty heavily, s sort of 60 to 75 percent on the none or elementary um, level of knowledge. But I don't want to spend a huge amount of time explaining what blockchain is because the big red clock is ticking. So we're going to jump on to the next question um, to ask if you've considered including digital assets or cryptocurrencies in your investing. Your options are no, it's all a big fat scam. Um, for the Arrested Development fans, we have maybe, you might say I'm bi-curious. Um, you can indicate if you're planning on buying digital assets, if you already own them, um, or if you're going to the moon. If you don't go to the moon, don't choose it. <laughs> That's a reference from people who held cryptocurrency from the early days when it just kept going up and up and up, straight to the moon. And then they got very sad and posted sad memes online about, you know, the moon being broken when the prices all went down. There were some great memes of Ferraris with like moon as the number plate back in the um, heyday of Bitcoin shooting up. It's funny, in the, in the Bitcoin um, world, sometimes people will introduce themselves by the price at which they bought in to say, oh yeah, I've been in Bitcoin since, you know, $150 days or $5 days uh, as a short shortcut for been around nine or 10 years. Oh wow, I've had like 30 people dive into this. I hadn't tried out this little type of question before, so that's great. So we have a lot of people who are, who are interested and a bunch of people who already own digital assets. And had I thought through my questions more, I could have split that up between cryptocurrencies or, or other um, digital assets that might represent ownership. Here, when I mean digital assets, I'm not talking about, say, buying shares on E-Trade or something. I mean proper digital assets where they're secured by the blockchain. And then we, of course, have our Bitcoin maximalist fans who are going to the moon. 
and a surprising number of people who think it's a big fat scam. You guys can come chat to me afterwards if you like. I'm always happy to educate folk. Now, what digital assets are you most interested in? I've given you the options of whatever my broker is offering me. Fractionalized property has been pretty exciting and an area that a lot of people have been getting into. Tokenized gold, we've got um, quite a few people exhibiting today around tokenized gold and some, I think a comment was made before of there's just a bunch of them that are coming out lately and I um, do need to give a shout out that I'm advising a project called Xbullion out of um, Singapore which will hopefully be launching later in the year but we've also got InfiniGold and the Perth Mint project speaking this afternoon. That's a fantastic project that had some great press um, last week. So here we are, we have a lot of people interested in Bitcoin or Ether, uh, which is actually surprising. I was expecting tokenized gold to be much, much more. And one brave soul putting up their hand saying, hurrah for Facebook. You would not be welcome at the US Congress this week. If you have six hours to kill and you don't like Facebook, the grilling of Mark Zuckerberg by the congressman is quite entertaining. Um, I'm advising a Libra project, so I, shouldn't, I can't be harsh on them, but I also think it's a really good project. Um, and it's an interesting one I'll speak to on the investing front because it has an, a very interesting twist because of its asset backing that I don't think has been properly recognized in the media around that project. Um, and of course, with everything in investing, those who get in early might be able to take advantage of that. Um, this is the best description I've ever come up with for blockchain. And given there was a few people who indicated they didn't have any knowledge or was elementary around blockchain, um, I give a lot of talks on blockchain, so this, this sort of summed it up for me. Uh, I often gave the example of um, Excel files. So here we say, if you imagine that you have a file of transactions on your computer, and there's a couple of accountants who also have the same file as you, and when you make any transaction, whatever that is, say for our purposes, this, this list of transactions is ounces of gold. If you say, I'm, I'm moving an ounce of gold to Mike, because he's an awesome speaker and I just want to give it to him. Um, so then these two accountants will rush to make sure that in fact on that ledger you do have that ounce of gold to give to me and that you're not trying to, for example, give it to me but also give it to Fred Chabester or someone else at the exact same time. This is a classic problem in the digital asset world known as the double spend problem because everyone knows how to copy and paste text in Word, right? So digital assets in the early 2000s had this massive problem that if you made something digital, you could just copy and paste it. And the whole miracle of blockchain technology and decentralization is it solves the problem of being able to otherwise cut and paste what would be a digital asset. It creates this digital scarcity, which enables you to then say, excellent, this digital thing I have stands alone and no one can take it away from me, as opposed to, for example, a, um, a share, which is kept on a central registry that a central person controls. So here, they check to make sure you can afford that transfer, and if, that, if in fact you can, they say in our little example, hit reply all on email and say, yes, you totally have the gold to give to Mike, and then that person who replies first gets a reward, and if the others, other accountant agree, because here we're just saying two accounts to make it easy, then everyone updates their ledger, and you all, at the end of the transaction, you all have the same ledger again. And then times that by 10 or 100,000 in terms of checking. So the way the blockchain works is by ramping that basic principle up, dare I say, to the moon, but to a very large number so that you can be sure that there's a whole lot of people incentivized to check these transactions and no one's ever relying upon one person internally. The reason why everyone gets so excited about this is it will basically eliminate things like the Bearings Bank collapse and other massive collapses in the 90s where rogue traders came in and compromised things internally because when you have a lot of people very, very inexpensively checking whether or not transactions are valid, you can validate things at a level never before seen. Um, it does, in fairness, create the opportunity for surveillance capitalism, which some people get upset about, also in connection with Facebook. Someone over there I know would have that view. Um, but the power, you know, that's no different to saying sneakers can be used to, to um, chase people and catch them. It's just a technology. It just depends how it's used. Or to run away from police if you also wear your sneakers the right way. But jumping into regulation of digital assets, People only like to invest if they have certainty, and regulatory certainty is a big deal. Basically, every financial product, traditional financial products, have a web of regulation around them, and as a lawyer, I get to be in that all the time. And for people who aren't lawyers, it's not fun, because it's, like most law, almost feels like it's designed to be difficult for anyone but lawyers to understand. But what you do need to understand for Australian purposes is that we're very lucky in that the Senate, five years ago, had an inquiry into virtual currency 
And during that inquiry, ASIC, this, um, everyone knows ASIC as the Australian Securities Investment Commission, submitted to the uh, Senate, we don't think Bitcoin can be a financial product. Now, the exact reason for that is because Bit Bitcoin was never issued by anyone. It's only ever was created by um, computers as part of the mining process, back in our earlier example, the, the accountants. Um, so ASIC said, we don't think Bitcoin's a financial product. And people have taken that over time to extend to Ether, which is another one of the most popular cryptocurrencies out there. ASIC hasn't gone as far as putting it in official guidance to say that Ether is not a cryptocurrency. But I was at a lunch with some of my other lawyers where they put it up on a slide and we took a picture of the slide. So as far as I'm concerned, that's as good as um, published by the government. So we're quite happy in saying Bitcoin and Ether are not financial products. However, is this a good or a bad thing? If you're coming at it from an investment perspective, if they're not financial products, it means anyone who's offering them for sale or custodying them or doing other things technically is outside the camp of regulated behavior and licensed behavior, which is problematic from a trust perspective. Um, and many of those people who are operating in that space are trying to get into a regulated position and have licensing in place. But it also means there's a lot more risk of scams. And many people can fall from sc for scams. I was at an event the other day packed with people who knew a lot about blockchain and a gentleman who shall remain nameless came up to me and said, have you heard Bitcoin's totally gonna take off because Richard Branson has this thing where you can invest in it and earn 10% a week passively. Um, which of course I went, I don't hate to break it to you and I hope you didn't give these people any money, but no, that's a scam. Ponzi schemes work like that. Uh, but there is some, that's a major one that's gone around and taken a whole bunch of money and there's a lot of scams that are out there. There's also a lot of legitimate businesses doing really good things in this space and one of the reasons they've been able to grow so quickly is again, they're, not, they're in this regulatory gray zone. We're hoping in the next three to five years for Australia for that gray zone to become clearer. Um, for example, all the US custody um, solutions in cryptocurrencies in the US are not really custody. They're using this strange state level loophole to, to offer custody of digital assets um, and traditional banks are only now starting to look at it. Um, I've been advising a few banks on some processes they can look uh, to bring in. Most banks didn't want to touch it until insurance was in place, but thankfully earlier this year, uh, Lloyds of London syndicates started offering insurance over crypto, which was held in an appropriate place. Now the reason for this is because, my example earlier with shares, if you lose your share certificate, uh, there's always a way to go back to that central register and recover it. You can, for example, best analogy I give is, it's like resetting your password. Someone can do it. In a purely decentralized digital asset, it's like having the asset itself. No one's gonna be able to reset your password. And that scares a lot of people, but it also makes a whole lot of problems with custody because in a traditional custody world, uh, JP Morgan or Perpetual or someone sits on those share certificates as custody um, and nobody can take them away no matter what. And if they happen to get stolen or catch fire, they can always get the company to reissue them. You can't do that with digital assets. If they're sitting on a bunch of Bitcoin and somebody hacks in and steals the private key, which is the uh, password used to move the Bitcoin to someone else, they can just steal it. And there is no way to go back and have it reset because no one person controls the blockchain. See, from my earlier example, you're relying on these many other parties to verify transactions. You could go to those very many other parties and say, excuse me, thousands of people, if you all agree, can we reverse a transaction and give me my money back? But good luck with that. It's never really happened except in one very limited um, circumstance on the Ethereum blockchain, which is still scandalous to this day, where a large theft of um, many, many tens of millions of dollars was reversed and the clock was turned back on the, on the blockchain to give everyone their money back. Um, so those things do not happen very often. Now, I will say, show of hands, has anyone heard the phrase initial coin offering? Oh, look at that, heaps of people. And has anyone participated in an initial coin offering? Okay, so we have about five. And keep your hand up if you've made money from it. Ooh, that's actually a really high percentage. Um, so initial coin offerings were a big deal back in, from sort of 2016 to 2018, there was a bit of a big lump of them. They faded away more recently. Uh, and certainly in Australia, the regulatory position has been um, a little bit stricter. A number of ICOs back in the heyday were trying to offer tokens that came with revenue sharing or dividends. So look an awful lot like preference shares. And unsurprisingly, someone at ASIC said, hang on a minute, these look an awful lot like preference shares. And they're not being offered in a way that's consistent with the Corporations Act for keeping share registries and the like, because once you bought this token, you could do whatever you like with it. 
they all look like bearer instruments. So what happened around that time was ASIC shut down any ICO that had a dividend revenue or was trying to have an asset sitting behind it. Um, they were all just shut down. It only added up to about 12. There weren't that many in Australia, but they didn't shut down the, the, one, the projects which were offering tokens which didn't have asset backing behind them or revenue, which in one way is curious because they're not actually offering a financial return, but many of those projects were in fact seeking to offer a financial return for people by saying, we're going to issue a million tokens, our platform will be really successful and popular. You can see from this decentralized system that we can never issue more than a million tokens. Ergo, demand goes up, supply is fixed, price goes to the moon. Um, ASIC haven't been pushy on that here. The SEC in America has been very vigorous um, in both shutting down projects which offered returns. Um, a well-known one was Munchie, which had in their offering something to the effect of, if you buy our tokens, we estimate you will make 70% return within two months, which is not a great thing to put in your offer document when you're asking people for money and saying you're not a financial product or a security. But they did it, and then they got sued by the SEC and had to shut down their offering. Recently, there's been some very high-profile moves by the SEC, one against a company called um, Kik, which is a messaging platform who's alleged to have put a $100 million ICO out when they were running out of money and apparently have run out of that $100 million. I don't know how they managed to spend it that fast, but that's pretty impressive because they said, can everyone give us money to crowdfund our defense of the SEC? And they collected about $5 million. Um, I wish more of my clients could get crowds to put money in the can to pay fees. That'd be great. Um, and the other really high profile one recently is Telegram. Telegram did a $1.7 billion ICO. They originally were going to do it for about half that amount, but so many people wanted to buy their tokens that they just said, all right, we'll keep selling them. So they made a very restricted sale, um, two tranches. I think one was about 60 US cents, one was uh, $1.30 US cents, and the reference price that they were hoping to have when they were the tokens to be, to be delivered, which were to be delivered in five days, uh, was I think $3. So they put a big lock up on everything. They thought they did it the way that the SEC wanted using this thing called Reg D, where you can sell only to the American version of sophisticated investors, which is known as accredited investors. But two weeks ago, the SEC came in swinging and said, we think your entire token is a security. We don't want you giving anyone tokens. So these kinds of movements by regulators have kept investors out of a lot of digital assets unless they had a great deal of technical knowledge. So even in my day-to-day, -day, in my practice is very, very heavily skewed in blockchain, plus some fintech with neobanks and stuff, I still see that a lot of the people very, very active in cryptocurrencies understand the technology and are, for want of a better description, and I count myself amongst it, nerds. I come from a software programming background, and if you kind of are in computers in that zone, you can understand the tech a bit better, and you can actually go and have a look at some of the code. I don't pretend to be a very good author of code, but I can certainly read and understand most of it, or should I say some of it. Um, the way that most people are exposed to crypto these days is via exchanges. So the biggest ones in the country are probably BTC Markets and Independent Reserve. Uh, disclosure, I do a lot of work with Independent Reserve, and they're um, the, IR is the oldest exchange in the country, so they're about almost six years old now. So that's most people's interaction with cryptocurrencies, and as long as you're dealing with a reputable uh, business, then that is a safe way to do it. I say, well, it's not, because of the nature of digital assets, there are degrees of safety. So IR has an insurance, a category of insurance, uh, uh, sorry, account where they have insurance coverage, but they also have a category of account where there isn't insurance coverage. Um, I would, of course, suggest that anyone looking to buy cryptocurrencies on an exchange choose one that has insurance, because that's really important. Although, having designed some systems around storage of cryptocurrencies, I can tell you that if someone has met the insurance standard, I cannot fathom how they're going to get their cryptocurrency stolen because there's a lot of redundant layers of security in there to keep it safe, otherwise the insurers wouldn't touch it. But even going through that process and having that stored at that level of security is really important. There's been two very massive exchange hacks over the years, the first of which is a company called Mt. Gox in Japan, um, which was hacked in, at one point was one of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges in the world and um, then they lost 850,000 Bitcoin, which was embarrassing. Then they found 200,000 Bitcoin, which was, I suppose, good, but the 650,000 Bitcoin, which at one point was worth north of $7 billion, was allegedly laundered by a gentleman in, in Europe, who was eventually caught 
because of blockchain technology, the transactions are traced and he was identified. He's been languishing in jail now for, I think we're pushing two years while the American, French and Russian governments argue over who should get to extradite and prosecute him. Um, so a lot of those exchange hacks seem to have dropped off a bit, but um, I'll come to that in a moment. The big thing that people care about is tax. And there's a speaker later today who's going to be giving some more detailed tax, but we do have ATO guidance. There was a whole, the problem in crypto was there was a whole bunch of people who, as I, as I see it, being a little bit older than many of them, for the, uh, traditionally, by the time you got to a point in life where you'd you know, worked through having jobs and you were owning a business or something and collecting the raw cash, you were kind of conditioned to pay tax or at least go through your accountant and figure out the best way to work the system. And I sort of view it as, in crypto, a whole bunch of people who'd never been through that process suddenly had a pile of money and really didn't want to pay tax because it hurts if you get cash pre-tax and have to transfer it to the government. If it's taken out on a wage basis, it doesn't hurt so much because you never see it. That created a whole bunch of problems and the ATO came in and said, well, we're gonna have some guidance. It's essentially barter rules. These things really operate transactionally and tax-wise like financial products. So if you're, if you're looking at giving them treatment like capital gains tax, that's basically the way to go. There are some interesting quirks and one of our partners in Adelaide, Will Fennell, does a lot of crypto tax advice, but it does sit more in the companies that are looking to offer those products and ensure that they're either not running into a GST problem or how the reporting should come out. So using a kind of barter rule approach or treating them as analogous to shares is a really good way of doing it. The personal use exemption has been bandied around a bit for CGT free treatment of crypto. Who's familiar with the personal use exemption? No one, all right. Good example I always give, or one person. Kudos to you. You're a tax lawyer or an accountant? <laughs> um, good example I always give is a car, right? If you buy a car for your own personal use and it happens to go up in value because, I don't know, there was some cool defect in it that became, made it a collector's item. If you bought it for personal use and not for, as an investment and then you, it turns out it goes up in value and you sell it, there's no problem with that under Australian tax law. But the boundaries around personal use are always being pushed and while the ATO hasn't come out and said it, my sources tell me they do not like personal use around cryptocurrencies. Their original example was if you bought Bitcoin and it went up massively and then you used it to buy coffee pretty soon afterwards, you wouldn't have a CGT event on your coffee, even though your coffee might be free because it's gone up so much in value. Um, but I think that they feel like a lot of people may have abused that by saying, I am buying it for personal use. I am buying $100,000 for personal use and I'm holding it for years and then I'm selling it for a million dollars I don't have to pay tax. There is a private ruling by a lawyer, who else, down in Victoria who bought a bunch of Bitcoin, made a ton of money on it, sold half a million of it in order to go to the ATO and say, I've sold half a million, I don't want to pay tax on it. I originally bought it to have a play with it and it just became worth millions by accident. Let's talk. That hasn't come out yet. I will be delighted from my you know, inner lawyer child if he manages to convince the ATO not to tax him on that. Also because I bought a bunch of Ethereum in the early days and I don't really want to pay tax on it when I sell it. But um, I've been using mine to play around with smart contracts and keeping a journal. So if you want to use cryptocurrency for personal use, you probably want to keep a record of why you were using it. You know, a blog or something saying, today I use my crypto to play with a smart contract and, and see what kind of DeFi things there were out there um, for my learning. Keep writing those and if the ATO comes along, at least you have a record. But the exchanges nowadays have great automated systems Independent Reserve have um, a system that KPMG put together, and I know the guys at KPMG who did this. Great system. It can spit out the SMSF reporting. It can spit out the individual reporting for all of your trades. That is really important. Why? Because earlier this year, the ATO started approaching every single crypto exchange they could, saying, give us all your data on your customers and what their trading activity were, was, because we don't think they're paying tax. And that was on the back of in America where a grand total of, I think it was 1,900 people reported cryptocurrency trading gains in 2018. And the, in the, the Internal Revenue Service said, come on, everything's been going up and up and up and you really want us to believe that no one's making money? So that, um, here, because of our culture, most of the exchanges of course just comply with the ATO request. In America, a number of the exchanges said, no, we're gonna fight you in court. Um, government is bad and we don't want to hand over people's data. Also, I think because they knew there would be a lot of data matching. Uh, but the official ATO, sorry, the unofficial ATO position is frankly, if you give it a go and you're trying to do your tax right, you're not going to be given a um, rough end of the stick. 
they don't understand it either. They're dealing with all of their normal tax problems and normal resourcing and all the usual pressures from funding from the government trying to do more with less, and now they have this entire interesting asset class where a whole lot of people didn't keep records because in the early days, it was really hard to keep records. It has almost done my head in sitting down for entire evenings with my accountant trying to work out some trading stuff and it possibly didn't help that we drank a lot of wine while doing so, but we needed to because it's that painful. Um, so now that we have these solutions that you can plug into if you're using an exchange, another one that's worth looking at is dig uh, Digital Tax View. That one has multi-exchange support. Um, and that's, actually, that's an Australian-made one as, um, also. The KPMG one for Independent Reserve is homegrown, made in Sydney. Those are really useful. There's a bunch of online um, Google spreadsheets that you can also get, which are kind of neat because they'll take in live price feeds so that you can put in you know, your holdings and try and work out what capital gains might have been triggered or not. And, and that's another really useful thing to do. But if you're trading yourself, keeping your own records is always important, um, and the ATO expects it. So um, I'll let the speaker this afternoon go into a bit more detail about that. Now, jumping back to risks, I mentioned the, the Mt. Gox collapse in, in 2014. Um, interesting aside is that normally, in because um, in, the company obviously went into insolvency, but because the price of Bitcoin went up so much, the, li the version of the liquidator in Japan, and their laws are quite similar to ours, sold $350 million of Bitcoin at the start of 2018, uh, which possibly helped push the price down, but then paid out all the creditors. So you get this weird situation that normally all the assets would then be given to the shareholders. But in the Mt. Gox situation, all the shareholders were the directors, and they're all being sued for letting the security breach happen. So they said, we don't want the Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of the people who were the original investors saying, can we just have our Bitcoin back? Um, and it looks like, my guess is eventually, maybe in a year or so, they'll all start to be given their Bitcoin back, which will be worth more than it was at the time when the hack occurred. Because under traditional law, when a hack like that occurs or if a bank goes down, your loss would be the value of the asset on that date. But because it happened in 2014, before Bitcoin went up tens of thousands of percent, they would all be vastly better off just being given a couple of the Bitcoin even if you know, a percentage of whatever their total Bitcoin losses were, rather than being given back their actual original loss, if you can follow that. The other big hack that happened last year was Quadringa CX, a $250 million um, hack out of Canada, uh, which actually is being all prosecuted in Nova Scotia, where my wife is from. Again, bidding on a house right now. Much more nervous than being up here. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a message on my phone telling me. Um, so Quadringa CX was, uh, looks like it's actually a Ponzi scheme though, which draws me back to my original point about scams. This was a very legitimate looking exchange. And they didn't have audits because a lot of exchanges then didn't have audits. I, sh I should say BTC Markets and IR and others have proper audits from you know, big six auditing firms so that you know things are being done properly. In the Quadringa case, the founder had Crohn's disease, went to India and then died and promptly a bunch of people said he's faked his own death to steal our money. But EY in Canada has been investigating all of the crypto that's, that was stolen and actually looks like the guy was just spending it um, as it was deposited, possibly because he was terminally ill and living large, big time large, sort of renting gigantic uh, yachts and stuff. And you know, I guess people just thought his exchange was really, really profitable when he's posting pictures of that kind of stuff on social media, but it turns out it was probably their money. Um, however, just like Mt. Gox, there was a bunch of money that was recovered by the liquidators, so the people, I think it was about 50 million, so the people probably will get back 10 to 15 cents in the dollar, which is something. It's better than a kick in the teeth. Um, Tether, anyone heard of Tether? A few people. So Tether is a, was one of the first, or the most popular, I should say, stable coins, which is where you have a cryptocurrency backed by an asset. They're the US, US dollar, although it's sort of come out that they don't really have one US dollar per Tether, it's more like 74 cents. But strangely, even though it's only really 74 cents, the price of a tether is still one US dollar on, in most trading online. Um, so even though it's absolutely not backed at all to the degree everyone says it is, the price still reflects as if it was, which is really fascinating for anyone who's into economics, but otherwise is a very strange anomaly. Um, I've also noted just how much thefts have gone on. So if you're, if you're getting involved in this space and you want to do it yourself, you really want to make sure your security is set up and you understand um, the way that the technology works. If you don't want to go down that rabbit hole of really getting into the tech, stick with an exchange, one with good reporting. If you're with an Australian one, you're going to be able to get better reputation and know that they're being audited. 
Other things you can do if you're interested in getting more involved in this space and understanding it is RMIT and Oxford University have great online blockchain courses. Um, local Bitcoin meetups and blockchain meetups are really friendly, which is really cool. And that's only really arisen in the last sort of five to 10, not even, maybe five, last five years. You can just rock up to, to meetups and people are just thrilled to see new faces and meet new people there, which is great. Uh, and I'll give a little shout out. I started a blog a couple of weeks ago called Bits of Blocks. Don't know how that domain was not taken, but I'm pushing out weekly news on mostly law and regulation around crypto, but also some other things. Now, in my precious 30 seconds remaining, I was gonna see if I could get a little bit of feedback on my presentation today. I hope I didn't speak too fast, but I was trying to jam as much as I could in. Um, if there is anything else anyone wants to chat to me about afterwards, just call me. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, please feel free to connect. If you could send a message on LinkedIn if you want to connect, I get, an, for some reason, an awful lot of requests from Indian developers, so I have to sort of plow through all these um, requests all the time. Ah, so, well, if I go back, it may stop people from doing this. So it's called Bits of Blocks. B-I-T-S-O-F and then B-L-O-C-K-S dot I-O. Not dot com, that one was taken. But it also, if you just Google Michael Bacchino, it'll probably show up. I'm blessed with the unusual last name, so uh, I show up easily in searches, which is, a, I suppose, a good or a bad thing. Now, the big red light is flashing, so I thank you all for listening to my talk today, and especially those 16 or 17-odd people who've given some great feedback. I um, appreciate it very much. And now, I'll jump on. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Let them